Good morning and welcome to Highway Gospel Online. I'm so glad that you have chosen to take time out of your morning to spend with us. If you are a first time guest, I'd like to send an extra special welcome to you. And we'd love to have the opportunity to connect with you further. If you just take out your phone and you text us the word welcome to 416-267-1189 and you follow the prompts that are given to you, we can send you a more formal message in the mail. We also want to encourage you, join the chat. It's a great way to connect with the people who are also watching alongside you. So don't be shy, please say hi. <clears throat> the chat is super easy to use, but you have to subscribe to our channel first. Just hit the word subscribe, and while you're at it, why don't you hit the notification bell so that you will be notified whenever Highway Online is going to be premiering. To find out more about any upcoming events here at Highway, just go to our website, highwaygospel.ca, and click the events tab, and it'll show you everything that's coming up. I want to send uh, a special thank you to all those who have been continually giving to the mission here at Highway. And as a reminder, there's four ways to give. You can e-transfer us, you can use the Tithely app, you can give by using our website, and you can also send a check in the mail. We ask that you don't uh, send cash. Now to find the digital teaching notes for today's sermon, you can open up your Uversion app, go to events, and find Highway Gospel. Please check us out on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, Highway is a place to belong and you belong here.
Good morning, Highway family. Hopefully you saw my note in the chat and you've prepared your emblems because we're going to celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection together this morning. And as we do that, I want you to remember what Jesus did prior to going to the cross in the suffering he went through and then also that his blood was shed on the cross and his suffering was done on the cross and his death brought us back into the place where we can be in a proper relationship with the Father. That's what communion is all about, is about us using some symbols to remember what Jesus did for us. Let's look at scripture this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, where it says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take our bread as a symbol this morning, let's remember Jesus' broken body. Let's remember that his body was broken for our healing this morning. Let's not just do this out of routine, but let's eat together in remembrance. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. Thank you that your body was broken, that we might be healed. So we thank you this morning. And then in verses 20, I can't read that with my glasses on, 25. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's remember this morning that Jesus' blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, that we are forgiven because Jesus' blood was shed, that he died on the cross, that we might be forgiven. But let's also not forget that verse 26 where it says, do this in remembrance of me, because we do, and we do it remembering that he is coming again. So he didn't just die and stay dead. He rose again, ascended to the Father, and he's coming back for his church. Let's remember all of that as we drink together this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed. Your death that brings us back into right relationship with God the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Just before we go today, we're remembering what God's done for us. As we often do, I want to take time today to pray for our needs. So if you have a need, whether it be a physical need in your body today, whether it be an emotional need, a mental need, we, we can take those to God as well because he doesn't just worry about our bodies. He wants our minds to be right as well. Whatever your need today, let's just take some time as we pray to, to lay those needs at Jesus' feet. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you this morning that we have this awesome ability, that privilege and ability to come into your presence to celebrate your death and resurrection together. And we have this time where we, as we remember what you did, how you suffered, that you did, we can remember that you did that for our healing. Not only our spiritual healing with the Father, but our physical healing as well, Lord. So today, Lord, we just lay our needs before you. We ask you that you touch bodies, touch minds. Heal us today, Jesus. Lord, do miracles in our lives. Change our circumstances today as we look to you and as we remember you and who you are and what you've done. And Lord, as we remind ourselves today that you are still able, that you are still capable today. So Lord, help us to just lay those needs down before you and trust you to do the miraculous. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service. God bless you. Good morning, Highway Online family. It's so nice to be able to come back and be on this online platform with you, especially after the two weeks we've just had as Pastor Paul has been leading us through his series on miracles where we were just reminded and some for some of us taught that miracles still are happening, that we're still worshiping a God who can do miracles. And we're called to go out and heal and seek miracles, as Jesus told us, we will do even greater than what he did. So it's just been such a wonderful time, and I, I pray that you have received your miracle. And for those who are still expectant, continue to press on as we continue to pray with you as we move into a new se season together as a Highway family. Today's message I've had on my heart for a while, and I just feel that it's, after the last two weeks we've had, is just the perfect place to preach this message. So today we're going to be looking at a woman in the Bible. And for those who don't know, there are 170 women who are either named or alluded to in the Bible. And we are going to be speaking about one that isn't often spoken about. And this is the woman that Christ actually tells us to remember and to look back on. She is vaguely mentioned in her own story. Actually, she's only mentioned in one line, but the message and teaching she gives us is so significant. And I just feel that it's so important after talking about miracles and seeking miracles and being expectant for miracles that we spend some time learning about Lot's wife. So let's look at Luke 17, 32 to 33, where Jesus says this. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So here we have Jesus in the midst of a discourse about end times. He's being asked questions, and uh, he's just answering them, and he says, remember Lot's wife. And here we know Christ knows the importance of all the stories in the Bible, as we know he is the great interpreter. So if he's telling us to look at Lot's wife's story, there must be something that we're missing. He understands the true meaning of Lot's wife's story. Actually, the Jewish leaders talked about Lot's wife so much that they decided to give her a name because, as you know, maybe you don't know, Lot's wife is only ever referred to as Lot's wife. So they decided to call her Edith so that they would be talking about someone and they could use a name for a woman who isn't named. So if I say Lot's wife or I say Edith today, you know it's the same woman in the same story and we're talking about the same person. So let's look at the story of Lot's wife together. Let me quickly summarize the story of Sodom and Gomorrah for those who might not know or may have forgotten the story. Sodom and Gomorrah is a city during uh, the Old Testament that is known for great sin. It is a place where any sin that you can imagine is taking place, and it's taking place in an abundance, and it is called a very sinful, forgotten city. And two angels come, and they go see a man named Lot, who is the brother of Abraham, as you may know Abraham as one of the great figures of the Old Testament, and tells Lot that he is to flee Sodom and Gomorrah because God is finished with it. He is going to sweep it away, with fire, and he tells Lot to take his family and to flee Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot listens. He led his family towards a town called Zorah, and he spends time there just as a temporary state to protect himself for what is to come as God sweeps away Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's look at where we left off here, or we, where we pick this up. Genesis 19, 24 to 25 says this, then out of the sky the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, and all its inhabitants of the city, and whatever grew on the ground. Verse 26 is where we get to hear about Lot's wife, and it says, But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. That's the verse we're looking at today. Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. And when we read this verse, there's many reactions there's many interpretations 
And I'm just going to list a few. So maybe you're feeling these, or maybe when you read this, you, you, you have these emotions. Many people see this as a slight act of disobedience and a very severe punishment from God. They see this as an overreaction to looking back to what a lot of people would have looked back to. There's many times where people are driving and they're walking and a firework goes off. And they look, maybe they stop looking at the road for a second, and then they go back to looking at the road. And nothing nothing's harmful happens, you know, bad has occurred, and they just go about their very day. But what if this was hundreds of millions of fireworks, to put it in just a, a, a picture we can think about, raining down on a city to destroy it? It's very hard not to look back. It's very hard not to be curious to what this looks like. It's not like this is something we see it often in the Old Testament. It's not like something we see today. So it's very understandable to why she looks back. Some see this as very relatable and understandable, like I just said. And then some see this as a struggle to understand how someone can be turned into a physical pillar of salt. When we talk about Lot's wife, Edith, being turned into a pillar of salt, they're not talking figuratively or spiritually. They're talking literally. She was turned into a pillar of salt forever. This can be very tough to understand, but as we just came out of two weeks of talking about miracles, miracles are things we can't understand. We don't understand what's happening at a miracle. We don't understand why it's happening. We might not even understand the result of a miracle. But luckily, we have miracles listed in the Bible that helps us try and understand what God is possible, even though we understand a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of His power. We're going to look today at that those words, but looked back. In the original language, the two words are what to bet and miorah. And those two words are but looked back. And in the original Hebrew, they're not looked back out of curiosity or looked back out of slight disobedience. The look back that we're talking about is to look back with longing or desire wanting to to have what you're looking back on all this to say lot's wife desired what god was finished with her attachment to the past was greater than her commitment to the future she wanted what she was leaving more than what god was calling her to the future she looked back longing for the city of sodom and gomorrah he was allowing life, Lot's family to leave Sodom and Gomorrah before it was swept away since they were deemed faithful servants of God. And they were placed into a temporary stay. But she looked back at God sweeping away this sinful city and longed for it to remain, longed for it to be so that she could be there. Many theologians believe there's two reasons for why she was longing. Um, Especially for a city that is overflowing with sin, that God has decided he was finished with. It's kind of a little hard to understand. Like, why would you desire a city that God himself says, I am done with this because of how sinful it is? The first one was, the first theory that theologians believe is that she actually was born in the city of Sodom or in that area. So when she looks back, she sees her home city, she sees memory, she sees what she was grown up into. The other is, she was fond and tempted by the sin of the city. Keep in mind, in the book of Jonah, the city of Nineveh is, is deemed a sinful city full of people who are dangerous and is of great sin. And it's so dangerous, the prophet Jonah himself runs away. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh and preach the word because he sees how dangerous it is, how sinful it is, and he actually expects God to sweep it away. He waits to see the destruction of Nineveh, which never comes because the people 
end up repenting. But just to put this in perspective, Nineveh, a city deemed by a prophet too sinful and too dangerous, isn't swept away. But the sinful city of Sodom and Gomorrah is. So whatever you're picturing how bad Sodom and Gomorrah is, I want you to just to take it up another level because it, it was probably far worse than we could even imagine to what's going on there. She ends up desiring what's going on in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the other theory. And the result is she ends up stuck in a place she's not meant to be. God doesn't call them to stay as Zoar forever. It's not their new permanent residence. It's not the promised land. He doesn't tell them to stay there and live out their lives. He tells them to flee there, and later on in the story, calls them back. But she becomes stuck in a place she's not meant to be because she decided to long for the past. The angel of the Lord said, do not look back. Don't look back at, what, at what's burning. Don't look back at what I'm finished with. Don't look back at what God's from delivering you from. Don't look back. Look forward to the future. And her longing and desire overtook her. And she looked back and became a pillar of salt. She looked back and got calcified in a place. She got calcified in place. She became stuck in a place where she was only meant to be passing through. This was supposed to be a quick trip to keep sanctuary, keep protection. And then she would have returned with Lot and continued out the story together. This was not where God had planned for her story to end. This is not where God planned for her to stay. This is not the season he was calling her into. But because she longed for it, she was stuck, stopped from entering her future with God. And you may be thinking today, well, I haven't been turned into a pillar of salt. God hasn't said that I need to flee because there's fire and brimstone coming. How does this story relate to me? And we have to remember, back to Luke, Jesus tells us to remember Lot's wife, not just as a warning or something we should be fearful of, but as a great teaching. Because we ourselves can be stuck. And maybe it's physically, but it can also be spiritually and emotionally. We can be stuck in the same season, in the same job. We can be stuck emotionally in a relationship. Or because of a relationship ending, we can be stuck longing for it. We can be stuck in so many ways. And we can be stuck for so long that we kind of forget that we stuck. We are stuck. So I want to ask you today, are you stuck? We are so busy looking back and longing for our old lives, old memories. We're not moving into something that's new. Are you longing for the past this morning? Do you feel stagnant? Do you feel like it's been a long time since you've stepped into something new? You've done new things. God has called you to new places. Have Has it been a while since you've been spiritually stretched? For those who don't know, spiritually stretch is just when God pulls you out of your comfort zone, puts you in a new area, and He teaches you something new. He has you confront something new, and it stretches us. It makes us more useful, and it teaches us great lessons. Have you not stepped into a new spiritual life, a new personal life, a new love life, a new working environment, new work for God? Maybe you are stuck this morning. You might not even realize it. Maybe you've been in this place for so long that you've just called it quits and you've decided, this is where I'm going to stay. Maybe it's not where God has called me to be, but this is where I'm going to stay. And for some of us, we're wondering, how do I become stuck? Obviously, I haven't looked back at fire falling from the sky onto a city, but how do I become stuck? If you've been dealing with this feeling of, of being stuck or stagnant or stale, maybe you're not calcified on a hillside while God sweeps away a city, but maybe you're just stuck and you're not where God is calling to you to be. And I want to tell you today, He's calling you to become unstuck. Remember Lot's wife. 
We become stuck when we desire what God has finished with. As the story teaches us, she was longing for what God had called them out of. The angel said, he is done with this city. He is finished with it. Leave. Go on. Don't look back. Look to the future. And she longed for it. And there's many times where God calls us out of a season. He calls us out of a relationship, out of a job. He tells us to go to something new. And we loved where we were coming from so much that we're kind of being pulled back by it. We're kind of one foot in, one foot out. There's many times where we just feel like we have, we can't throw away what we're leaving. And it puts us in this in-between. It puts us in this season where we feel stuck and we become stuck. We desire the past. Maybe it's an old job. Maybe you, you love an old job that you have and you just go into work every day thinking, I wish I had my old job. Maybe it's you're, you're in a new relationship or you're not in a relationship and you just keep looking for the memories of an old relationship you have and it's keeping you stagnant from moving on. Maybe it's a life-altering change that took place and you're just longing to revert back to that time. I know when COVID hit in 2020, I know we're all tired of talking about COVID, but in 2020 when COVID hit, four months, six months into that time, I just spent every day thinking, I wish I could go back to a time where we weren't inside, where we weren't afraid of wearing, uh, uh, being afraid of catching this disease, of getting sick, of getting our loved ones sick. I just want to be able to go for a walk and feel content. And I was longing for a time period I couldn't go back to. And it left me stuck because I wasn't looking to what, the future holds what God has called me to, to the opportunities God is putting in front of me because my head was just turned looking back thinking, I wish I could go back. And the past is a thing where we desire it, but we can't hold on to it. The moment we try to, it's already gone. So we look at the past as something to pull forward, but we can't. And that leads us to being stuck. Another way that we can become stuck is when we root ourselves in the temporary. Like I said, God wasn't calling Lot and his family to Zoar for a permanent state. It was temporary. And it became a permanent home for Lot's wife because of her desire for the past. When we treat the temporary as the permanent, we treat what we're passing through as where God has called us to settle we begin to block out the rest of the world. We stop seeking the things God is putting forward for us. We stop seeking miracles. We stop seeking change. Pastor Paul talked about it. Sometimes when we don't get miracles or we don't expect miracles, it's because we don't want them. Because things change. And sometimes change is scary because we don't understand we can't control it. But when we root ourselves in the temporary, we're forgoing the changes God is trying to make. Sometimes we root ourselves in the temporary because we see a a need. We see a need in the area we're passing through. And we think if we stop here and help, this is where God is calling us to be. Sometimes we see enjoyment in the passing through. And we go, I didn't like the past. I don't know what the present's holding. I like where I am, so I'm going to root myself here, and I'm not going to move. And it begins to hinder us and stop us from all the things God has for us. When we don't wait or seek God's wisdom on our plans for our lives, and we take matters into our own hands, we become stuck. We don't enter into new seasons because we don't know how to. We enter new seasons because God calls us to take a step of faith, and he puts them in front of us. And we end up dwelling in a space we are not meant to dwell. We stay longer than we're supposed to be. We learn and experience things that we're not supposed to learn and experience, and it changes us. It transforms our hearts. It changes our mindsets. And it makes it harder for when we inevitably step up into the new season, because we have to unlearn this stuff we have to learn new things and they begin to conflict with one another 
influences our desire to the future. When we root ourselves in the temporary, we are telling God, I don't want your future because I've picked my future. And that's not how it works. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. If we try and act outside of it, things go wrong. It's when times are rough and we don't actually serve Him or reach our full potential because we're serving ourselves. And we may think we're serving others by doing so, but all we're doing is holding back the blessings and work we could be doing for others, for the experiences we could be experiencing, for the lessons we could learn. The final way we become stuck is we become afraid to press on. I'm just going to share a quick personal story. In about 2015, 2016, I was diagnosed with anxiety and panic attacks, and it became so bad that I wanted to stop going out. I stopped trying new things. I stopped meeting new people because I felt so anxious that it was just easier to be where I already knew. And I would just stay home or be at church or just stay around the same people. And I wasn't growing because I was using these areas as a safety blanket. And what I began to see what happened was even though I had these places and these people, I began to become anxious even in these places. I remember the first day waking up and getting ready for church and having anxiety attack. And I was like, this is supposed to be a safe spot for me. I'm not supposed to be anxious to church. And the things I became content with became things that made me anxious, began to give me anxiety and panic attacks. It took me way too long to realize I'd become afraid to press on. And I had become afraid to even be where I was supposed to be. Because when we become afraid to press on, we put ourselves in a place where the enemy can continuously attack us. And the places we think are our sanctuaries, he begins to trap us in. He begins to continue to feed on our fears to stop us from seeking God for the strength and courage and faith to stand up and step out and to press on to God. He tries to drown out He tries to drown out all the wisdom we have that we've received from God so that we just stay in this spot where we're not useful to God. If we're not doing anything, then we're not doing any good work. The enemy doesn't need us to do bad things. He just doesn't need us. He just wants us to not do good things. He puts us in a place where uh, we can't drown out the fear and the noise of the world. And we just become stuck in a place, afraid to press on. We become stuck. And it took me so long to realize this. And thankfully, after just fasting and praying into it, He broke these things off of me, and I haven't had anxiety or anxiety attack in seven-ish years, but it took me a long time to realize I was stuck in a place, afraid to press on. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you, no matter how anxious you are or how scared you are or nervous you are, you're never too far away to press on to God and ask Him for the courage and strength to stand up out of where you are stuck and step into your new future. What is God calling you from? What are you longing for? What has you stuck this morning? And I can't answer this question for you. I can't tell you what you're stuck with. Only you and God know that. So I want to encourage you to just spend time, maybe today, maybe in the next few weeks, just asking God, what what's holding me back? What's causing me to be stuck? Maybe some of you have already, already know and you've been having this feeling of stagnation where you just don't feel like you're growing. You're not developing your spiritual gifts. You're not growing in your prayer life. Your time in the Word doesn't feel like you're, you're getting it. Maybe you already knew that you were stuck. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you to take whatever you're longing for, whatever has you stuck, whatever is giving you fear to press on, just 
give it over to God because he's going to take it and he's going to break it apart and he's going to put it back together into something beautiful that will transform your life. And you will not look at, back at this area as an area where you failed or you felt stuck, but as something where you go, that is the moment where God changed my life forever because he decided that I was worthy enough to become unstuck. But you also have to have that mentality. You have to believe that you are worthy of pressing forward. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and he's calling you to step into it today. Like I, I talked about at the beginning, we spent two weeks talking about miracles. We're stepping into a new season as a church family where we're just going to be expecting miracles. We're going to meet all things in, in prayer like we've talked about for the last few years. We're praying first. And as a highway family, we're going to move into this season praying together, leaning on each other, lifting each other up, which means we not only have to be willing to go to each other for prayer or to be transparent, but we also have to be willing to be listeners and prayer warriors. And we have to be willing to stand beside each other as we lift each other up and we pray for God to move in our church. God will make a way regardless of how you've become stuck. It doesn't matter if it's any of the, the reasons I've listed of becoming stuck. It doesn't matter because God is the miracle worker. He's the way maker this morning, and he's always been that way. Just like Lot and his family, he will make a way out of Sodom and Gomorrah for you so that you don't become stuck. You don't become in a place that gets swept away. But you have to go to him and ask him and pray that he leads you through. And then when you get the wisdom from him, you actually have to listen to it. Sometimes we pray for things and we say, God, give me the wisdom to get through this. Give me the wisdom to transform this situation. And then he gives it to us and we go, that doesn't really end how we want it. That's not the result we want. So we don't do it. And then we're stuck in the same place because God's wisdom and his truth doesn't change just because we don't like it. And we end up becoming stuck in an area we're not supposed to be. So I want to encourage you today. Seek him to become unstuck. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says this. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention of things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Did you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. God will make a way, even if you are feeling stuck, even if you don't think there's a way into this new season, God will make a way, like it says, rivers in the desert, the unexplainable, the impossible becomes possible through him. God is calling us to leave behind our past and look at the future as he leads us into this new season. We've been expecting miracles here at Highway. As Pastor Paul spent last two weeks pre uh, preaching on and praying into, and we, we prayed together as a church family. But if we're going to look to the future and walk expectantly into the future, we can't be solely focused in the past today. So we have to give it up. We have to move it aside, and, put, and some of us need to push through it and step each and every day looking for the future. Philippians 3.13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. God has something in store for each and every one of us and we need to be reaching ahead for it. We need to be constantly moving forward for it. We can't remain stuck. We can't remain in the same season over and over again because things will continue to pass us by. People will continue to pass us by while we stay stagnant. You see people have these new spiritual gifts. Their prayer lives have cultivated into developed into something where you see them pray and you go, I want to do that. You can't have that if you're stuck. You can't 
pray for people and see miracles if you're stuck. You can't be given godly wisdom to speak into people's lives if you're stuck. You can't see change in your families, in your workplaces, if you're stuck. Because if you're not useful and usable, you can't, God can't use you to do these things. Highway, as a church family, as the body of Christ, must continue to press into Him. We, the Highway family, must continue. It doesn't just stop last Sunday. Many of us got healing. Some of us are still expecting them. We don't just leave last Sunday going, I didn't get my miracle. It's over. I'm done with it. Some of us who received miracles can't say, well, I got my miracle. I'm done. I'm good to go. doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't stop last Sunday. It's an everyday journey that we are walking as a church family. And we need to press into him more and more and more. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says this, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that is so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Snare, sin ensnares us. It stops us. It hinders us. Like Lot's wife, when we look back and we're longing for the past and we're disobedient, it prevents us from moving into what God has prepared for us. So let's throw away all the longing and desire for the past. Let's throw away all the, the, sinful, the sinful habits we have that are tripping us up and ensnaring us. Let's break chains today by His name so that we can move as a church family into this new season. Pastor Paul mentioned, I think, I believe two weeks ago, quickly when it talked about miracles that Joshua, the leader of Israel in the Old Testament, the newly ordained leader, was instructed to silently march around the fortified walls of the city of Jericho for six days. And they did that in faith. They marched for six days around, once each day. And on the seventh day, the Israelites were called to march seven times, blow blowing ram's horns, celebrating, worshiping, expected for this miracle to take place for these walls these mighty walls that had never been breached to fall so that they could take the land of Jericho they were expected for an act of God even when they couldn't fathom the result and on that seventh day they were faithful and they went out and they were blaring the ram's horns and they were worshiping and they were thanking God and they marched around and around and around seven times and the walls fell. If you want the walls in your life that are keeping you stuck, the calcification that is keeping you stuck, you need to be expectant. And as we're walking into this new season today, church, we are marching expectantly for miracles to take place. If you have been here today and you've heard this message and you feel that you have been stuck, we're going to take a moment just to pray for you. But if you've heard this and you maybe don't know Jesus and you're feeling stuck in your life and you've come to the realization that the only way to become unstuck, the only way to progress in life and enter this new season and become the person Christ is calling you is because of Christ and you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and, and throw away the sins, your sinful habits, we're going to pray together. We're just going to take a moment. But what I want you to do is just pick up your phone and text the word LOVE, L-O-V-E, to 416-267-1189. That's the number here at the church. Highway, our purpose is to preach the word and live alongside each other, bringing people to Christ and then walking with them. And we want to walk with you in your new journey with Christ, but let's just pray together. Dear Lord, we're just 
so thankful that you are a God who walks with us. You are a God who speaks to us. You are a living God who moves with us. And we're so thankful, God, that we can look to you expectantly for new things, God. That you are a faithful God that does not forsake us or abandon us, Lord. And I just pray, God, that those who are feeling stuck today, those who feel like they haven't been able to move, that have feel, felt hindered, those who feel like they haven't progressed, Lord, I pray that whatever the reason is, Lord, you shake it off them. You call them into who they're supposed to be, into this new season, into their purpose, God. That you break the chains on their lives, Lord, so that they step freely into you, that they press onto you today, Lord. That you remove the fear that's keeping them in where they are, Lord. That they can faithfully and courageously step into you, Lord. And I pray for those who maybe are hearing about you for the first time today, Lord that are feeling stuck, that are feeling like they need refreshment, God. I just pray that you pierce their hearts and they feel you in their spirits, Lord, that you speak to them. And as they accept you this morning, Lord, I just pray that you blow refreshment through their lives, Lord, and that you give them the energy and the, the courage to step out in faith and live a life for you, Lord. And we're just so thankful, God. For who you are and we're so excited for this season that you've placed us in lord in your precious name we pray amen like i said if you decided to accept christ as your lord and savior pick up your phone and text the word love to 416-267-1189 we, we will be in touch with you as we walk this journey this spiritual walk with you together i just want to say it's been so Lovely to be back here Highway Online. I hope you enjoyed the service. And if you are local to us here in the Scarborough area, I wanna encourage you to come to the building and join us next Sunday, same time, 1030, where we can just worship and pray together physically. If you can't, that's okay, because Highway Online is still here, 1030 next week. And I just wanna encourage you to press on to God this week, become unstuck in Him, and just be expectant for what he holds for you in this new season. Enjoy, the, enjoy your week, and remember, Highway is a place to belong.